Welcome back to the State of the Union Conference. Still here with us on stage is George Papa Constantino, Professor of International Political Economy and Director of Executive Education School of Transnational Governance at the European University Institute for the next session, which will be a wide-ranging conversation on some of the most burning issues and questions, starting from the ECB's response to the crisis, going towards climate change and digital currencies. Good morning, everyone. Good evening to all those that are watching us from around the world. It is a great pleasure and a privilege to welcome to the State of the Union Conference the President of the European Central Bank, Christine Lagarde. A warm welcome, Madam President. Thank you so much, George. And sorry about your voice. Uh, that's OK. It's, it's gradually coming back. Good. Uh, I, rather than introduction, uh, if you allow me, I'd like to go straight in with, with the first question, which has a personal character because it's about managing and leadership in, in crisis. You uh, assumed your duties as, as president of the, of the ECB in November uh, 2019, at a time when one would have thought that it would be a relatively smooth period. Instead, of course, in the beginning of 2020, COVID hit, and you had to lead the ECB's response to that. Before uh, you arrived at the ECB, you were the managing director of, of the IMF, and you stepped in uh, at, in the middle of the Eurozone crisis, again, at a very critical period. And before that, you were the French Minister of Economy and Finance, uh, where I had the, the, the pleasure and privilege to first get to know you, and you were handling the, uh, uh, the French economy in the middle of the global financial crisis and it's morphing into the Eurozone crisis. So my first question to you is, what personal lessons do you draw from managing crisis and from leadership in crisis? George, it will not surprise you that I draw a, a couple of lessons. Uh, one is, it's often the case that women are called in to deal with crisis, to deal with mess, to deal with uh, difficult issues, and they don't do bad. They, they don't do a bad job. Uh, that's point number one. Um, point number two: My husband often says, after the ECB, please don't take another job because we don't want another crisis. And my third uh, lesson is that. We don't deal with crisis alone, and there are no heroes um, in those moments. The heroes are the teams. The heroes are the team that actually pull um, all the all the water, carry the water, pull the work roll up their sleeves. And I think that one of the things that I know how to do is to generate the level of stamina, confidence in people working together. And, you know, that's what I have observed um, back in 2008, uh, back in 2011, and back again in um, the beginning of 2020. Uh, the teams have, everybody has to be uh, available, ready, and, uh, and it's how we face those situations. That's on a very broad uh, sort of leadership levels. And of course, situations of difference, whether you are the finance minister of a country as you were in those days, or whether you are leading uh, the International Monetary Fund and trying to rescue one country after the other, or whether you are a central bank governor of a very large region like the Euro area. So let me then move from the personal to the institutional, but stick with the theme of lessons for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, I think we all agree that, that the EU institutional response in the current crisis, it's a different crisis, but the response has not only been different, but probably better, more timely, more effective. The question there is, what have we learned, what has the ECB in particular learned from its policies in the Eurozone crisis that it applied, in a, perhaps in a better way, in the current crisis? You know, from your question or your point, I would actually strike, probably, because I'm really convinced that the response of Europe was impressive, was coordinated, and was decisive. Um, if you look at the speed at which we responded, it was impressive compared with what had to happen during 
the uh, global financial crisis and the great financial crisis, as, as it's often called. Second, it was coordinated. Uh, if you look back to March 2020, it's quite impressive to see how monetary policy was decided in very short order. And rapidly, you know, we at the ECB took out the, the double bazooka of PEP on the one hand and Taltros on the other one. And then very, in very short order after that, uh, fiscal response at the European level was also considered, as were structural um, decisions such as the escape clause and state aid, which was significantly relaxed in order to enable national member states to also use their fiscal arm in a very decisive way. And then there was also the prudential measures that were decided that freed up about 120 billion capital for banks to lend as much as they could. So you had this fourfold approach that really came together in a matter of days that addressed the concern that was once common. Common because we had this external massive threat and because there was a common determination that we had to put people first and make sure that income was preserved. It's actually fascinating when you look, you know, we have a little bit of, of time now to, to look at, at numbers and what has happened. When you look at uh, the employment remuneration of people on a euro area basis, you see that it has declined say in the fourth quarter of 2020 by 2%. But if you look at household income, it has increased by a little less than 1%. And that speaks volume for the furlough schemes, for the support that were put together by member states. I would add as a third point that it was commensurate with what was needed. If you combine the national regional fiscal packages, including the automatic stabilizers, talking about nearly 7% of GDP. If you look at the guarantees and the schemes that were put in place to support the financing and to help banks actually give credit to the enterprises, the corporates of all size, you're talking about 19% GDP. So there was a very sizable amount that was made available that was called to actually support uh, the, the continuation uh, of the economy. And that, that, that was predicated on a different approach. I think there was very quickly uh, an understanding that we were hit altogether. Well, some countries were hit first, but altogether we were hit. And we could only get out of it altogether. And we could not rely on external forces or any kind of you know, big brother that would come and help us. The second aspect is that contrary to the great financial crisis, where, you know, fiscal and monetary did not operate in good coordination and where fiscal sometimes was a headwind to monetary policy, fiscal and monetary actually operated in good synchronization, very good coordination all along. And you know, the third point is that it was also dealt with on, on a union basis. And clearly what was decided in July by the European Council and confirmed by the European Parliament was an indication that as we were hit together, as we had to get out together, we had to borrow together and we had to lend to each other. And that's the next generation EU fund, which is a complete uh, difference from what we had during the great financial crisis. This approach that which was in solidum and that there had to be some grants and that there had to be some very attractive loans in addition to the key programs of the uh, EIB, of SURE and of the ESN to support corporates, employees and sovereigns. So it was very different. And, you know, we, we both lived the first one. We know what it was like. <clears throat> Indeed, we were more coherent this time around and, and certainly using better instruments and tools and more courageous perhaps also. One question is, however, is that as we come out of the crisis, uh, 
inequality in our countries will increase. And there's the distribution aspects of policies which we need to take a look at. And the question there is, um, is the ECB uh, going to address that? I mean, for example, the US Fed has, uh, in, in a recent review, has addressed the distributional impact of its policies. This led even to changes in the way it does its inflation targeting. Would the ECB go in, in, in a similar direction? Well, as, as you know, we are not operating with the same uh, mandate as the Fed. <clears throat> Fed has a dual mandate, we have a single mandate. Um, and that single mandate is price stability. Uh, obviously, we're also looking at what happens uh, from a macroeconomic point of view. And there is no price stability if the, uh, the labor markets are not stable and, and solid. So we look at that as well. But if you hit at the actual question of uh, the distributional impact of monetary policy, um, you know, the, the two, um, two categories of arguments, you have one, uh, one category of thoughts along the lines of, um, well, you know, by being so active in the asset purchase programs, by putting out so much liquidity, you contribute to increase of asset prices. And that has an impact on those that <clears throat> can afford those assets. Then there's another class of thoughts which is equally relevant, which will argue that by uh, supporting price stability, uh, we are contributing to the labor market and we're contributing to growth. And of course, we don't have enough uh, you know, time over which to consider that. But we did so concerning the great financial crisis. And it is a fact that monetary policy contributed more than 2% point of growth, which is also more than 2 million jobs as a result. And clearly contributing to more jobs uh, as an impact and a direct impact on reducing inequality. Now, if you allow me, George, uh, the current crisis that we're going through, this pandemic and, and economic or post-pandemic economic crisis that um, uh, the whole world is going through and that the euro area is going through will create inequality. And we have to look at it very carefully, all of us. But as much as we have to contribute price stability, deliver this growth and these jobs, Clearly, the fiscal authorities are the ones whose job it is to address those questions and actually have the tools to uh, address the distributional impact and the possible inequalities that will result. But inequality there is and there will be as a result of this pandemic. When you look at, at jobs again, those that are most affected are the low-skilled jobs and other jobs normally filled in by young people. So these two categories will be worst hit, have been worst hit, whereas the high skilled jobs and these sort of more senior citizens uh, jobs have been, for some of them, enhanced and improved and compensation increased. You mentioned that the ECB, of course, uh, compared to the Fed has a single mandate, but of course the ECB has also a secondary mandate and um, a, a lot, there's a lot of discussion around that. My, my question is, is, is related to the activities under this secondary mandate. The ECB is very proud and generously guards its, its independence. And I think it's recognized as perhaps the most independent central bank in the world. How does one reconcile uh, the need to maintain this independence with the need at the same time, especially as one goes more into secondary mandate issues, for more uh, accountability and democratic legitimacy? What is the way to make those two fit together? I think the, the conduit between these two um, is transparency and is a constant communication to those that we are accountable to. And you know, I'll give you an example. Uh, in, in the last 12 months of uh, the crisis, I have been in communication 
and in uh, whether you call them hearings or whether you call them uh, meetings uh, matters but at the end of the day we are in those zoom rooms or you know web rooms together with the european parliament or with the econ committee which is our normal counterpart in the european parliament for those uh, regular uh, reporting moments 13 times compared with the normal seven times per year. So I think that this increased um, um, transparency, honest communication, uh, sometimes in camera, because that's also the way we can, we can work best sometimes, uh, is testament uh, to our accountability, while at the same time, as is called for by the treaty itself and by the statutes under which we operate, the European Central Bank is absolutely and fiercely independent. And, uh, you know, I cannot receive instructions uh, from um, leaders of uh, the Euro area member states. You know, when the, my colleague from the Bank of England receives on a regular basis annually, if I recall, a letter from the Treasury, I don't receive such letters. And, uh, it's the way it was decided by the founding fathers. There were not many mothers in those days um, of, um, of the euro, that the ECB, because of its very specific nature of having now 19 member states and 19 national central banks forming the euro system, should absolutely be independent. But independence is not um, exclusive from being transparent, from being accountable, and from being, you know, responsive when, when issues are raised. Let me now turn to the twin green and, and digital transition. You have you've stressed the need for the ECB to contribute to the green transition. You've talked about a green central bank of greening the ECB portfolio. How far would you go? Um, would, for example, the ECB incorporate climate change fully into, into uh, its monetary policy like the Bank of England? Would you use preferential ECB lending rates to commercial banks for green investments? It's a little bit premature to answer all these questions, uh, George, because how climate change impact our monetary policy is actually one of the key, um, it's not the key, but it's one of the key topics of our strategy review. And we have not completed the review. We will complete it in the second half of uh, 2021. And we've agreed that it is not agreed until everything has been agreed. So I cannot really address, um, you know, how it's going to be uh, delivered, but it will be part of our monetary policy. How it will be part is what needs still to be decided and more importantly agreed. But let me point out that we already take into account climate change and the fight against climate change, which is my view is critical. Having recognized, of course, that the key drivers in that bus are not the central banks, but are the governments by way of uh, taxation, proper valuation of uh, uh, carbon emission uh, prices, um, it's on prices, and I mean, the, the list is, is, is not short. But despite the fact that we're not driving the bus, we are equally passenger of that, uh, of that bus, and we must play our part. So we do that in supervision. Uh, we've done, you know, uh, late last year, we published a, a guide for banks so that they understand exactly what we expect of them in terms of uh, disclosure, in terms of assessment of risks. Next year, at ECB level, we will conduct um, a stress test uh, of uh, what you know um, what could happen, and we will take into account a long horizon, which is unusual uh, for the kind of stress testing mechanisms that we have in place. Some of the national central banks have already started the exercise, but we will conduct it at a at a euro area basis in uh, in twenty two. That's a dimension that is already in place. Another dimension that is already in place has to do with the management of our non-monetary portfolio, 
where we have decided uh, to uh, significantly increase uh, the share of green bonds uh, in, in our portfolio. We've also given some strong signals to markets and the role that we play in markets when we purchase assets is important. Uh, we have, as of the 1st of January, uh, authorized the purchase of uh, unsecured secu bonds that are linked to ESG uh, um, principles. And, and that I think is an important fact that everybody knows that the ECB will be purchasing those um, particular assets. I think the bulk of the work that we are doing under our strategy review is to determine how it is going to impact our monetary policy and what role it will play on our instruments. Uh, what role it will play on monetary policy is pretty obvious. Uh, climate change will have, has already an impact on price stability. Uh, whether you look at uh, um, climate related events, whether you look at particularly exposed areas, prices will be determined as a result of that. In the same vein, the monetary policy space that is available will also be determined partly, not exclusively, but partly by climate change. If people assume that climate change is not taken care of, are they not going to save more? Isn't that going to restrict the space that monetary policy uh, can play? And in terms of instruments, um, although you know, uh, corporate asset purchases represents only a very small part of the overall portfolio of our monetary policy instruments, it is a part that is, that is significant. And where we have to ask ourselves, are we pricing risks properly? Are we applying the right haircuts as a result? Are we looking at disclosures that will be coming about soon? Are we assessing the transition path and the financing needs that there will be? So I think that that will have an impact on the instruments that we use in the future and the volume of those instruments as well and how they can be rated. I think we're all looking forward to discussing the strategic review and debating it. I have, I have a sense that my next question is also part of the strategic review, but um, the pandemic has accelerate everything digital. And in that discussion, there is, of course, a particular place for digital currencies. You have talked about the digital euro. Today's economist uh, leads with uh, the question of gov coins. Uh, so the question here is, okay, do we need one? Uh, and uh, would the, will the ECB be competing with cryptocurrencies? Where would that leave commercial banks? Oh, you can be a great opening, George. Cryptocurrencies, I mean, these two things don't go particularly well together, and I totally agree with Andrew Bailey's conclusion in that respect. There are crypto assets on the one hand, which people are free to invest in and take total risk into, uh, and there are particular cryptos that are, in my view, so prone uh, to, to uh, AML um, or to money laundering activities, to financing of strange activities, uh, that, you know, it's, it's, it's a real risk that people are taking. As, a, as Andrew Bailey, I think, said, you know, uh, I would only invest in that if I was prepared to lose it all. Uh, so th this is one category which has nothing to do with either stable coins or uh, the digital currencies such as digital euros or other digital currencies because, you know, many, many central banks around the world are looking at it. Do we need it? I tell you, I was personally first attracted to digital currencies and to digital payments, which we have many of, but digital currency we don't. Um, because when I was IMF, actually, because soon enough I realized that it could be a lot more inclusive, and in particular for women, in, notably in emerging and income countries, that it could be a lot cheaper, that it could be a lot more efficient and a lot faster. And when you start looking at, you know, many of those remittances that flow from country to country, um, it, it, it begs for uh, that kind of, of instrument. And once I came to realize that clearly um, at the IMF, first and certainly now wonderfully at the ECB, we are digging more into it. it it's, it's a huge, big project. 
which is fraught with lots of uh, technical issues, issues of principles, issues of sovereignty, issue of monetary policy transmission, issue of uh, role to be played by the traditional actors that uh, we are accustomed to and who will have to be brought into the picture so that they not, not only understand what is likely to happen, are concerned about it, but find their space as well. I know there is a lot of concern and worry from the commercial banks, some of which say, oh, don't do it, you know, no bother. I think we owe it to the Europeans to actually explore it and to decide later on whether we pursue the project for future decision making, which will not be only the remit of a central bank. I think it is too important to be only left to a central bank. It will have to involve legislators as well because it raises issues of privacy. Uh, it raises issues of um, structure of the financial sector as well. But if I hear what the Europeans are telling us, because we conducted a big thorough consultation process, they are very interested. They want it. The pandemic has accelerated the process. And about 50% of Europeans say, I'd like to pay digital. I'd like to use a device like that. We have and time for, sorry, okay. please. No, go ahead. Okay, uh, I was going to say that we have time for, for one, one final question. Um, as you know, our, our State of the Union conference is called Europe in a Changing World. And Europe's role in this changing world will also depend on the international role of our common currency, uh, the euro. There was a time in which uh, we were all relatively passive about that, thinking that um, all we need to do is complete the European Monetary Union, and that in and of itself would be enough to strengthen the euro in international transactions and, and, and in the world. There seems to be a shift uh, a little bit, um, starting from the commission, uh, commission communication a couple of years ago. DCB has done work on this, and there seems to be a more activist uh, feeling around this. Uh, for example, uh, through, of course, next generation EU and being able to issue in Euro, uh, uh, but also uh, more towards uh, using the Euro in international transactions in, in, in sectors such as energy or commodities. So the question here is, what is the ECB's view on this? Is it as neutral as it used to be? Would the ECB go as far as the seeking a mandate for, for uh, for swaps uh, to bolster the international role of the euro? I'm not sure what you mean by mandate about swaps, because we do have lots of swaps arrangements with other large central banks, including the Fed, the Bank of England and others. But on, on the, um, the international role of the euro, uh, I would first of all observe that contrary to the great financial crisis where the international role of the euro declined as a reserve currency, on the occasion of the pandemic crisis, uh, the euro as an international reserve currency did not decline. We hover at around 20% uh, by many metrics. So that's you know point number one. Point number two, um, I think there was a realization by authorities, not necessarily a central bank, but authorities that um, to be sovereign, uh, to have sufficient autonomy, to be able to control some supply chains had also a currency dimension, and that the euro had to be that international strong currency that it aspired to, I think, upon creation. But I would make two additional points, George. Uh, however desirable it is, it is not going to happen unless and until we have a strong, deep, liquid capital market union. And that project has been lagging for a long time, despite all efforts, because they are vested territories. There is no harmonized supervision sort of, in, of, of enough uh, depth and substance. And we have 27 different uh, capital markets, not one, as opposed to the US. So I suggested yesterday I give a little uh, talk at an event organized by the Commission. I'm happy to repeat it here. As a pilot, I would very strongly support that we explore a green capital market union 
because we could find a way of not stepping into anybody's territories or toes and of starting from, from scratch uh, a pilot that could maybe help us move faster on the CMU that we need to really play a role as an international currency. Second, I think um, if you look at the US, for instance, which is clearly a strong uh, currency by all accounts, um, having those big treasury bonds and the depth of that market clearly plays a role. It's very interesting to see how the next generation EU fund is going to generate those um, union instrument. And I know it's a, it's a one shot, it's one off, it's not forever, but at least it gives us the learnings, the understandings, the appetite of markets for such type of approach. And, you know, just as we had, we could have a pilot with a green CMU, maybe that has elements of a pilot until such time when the political um, consensus will move in the direction of really having um, a very strong euro that could play an international role that I think it deserves. And on, on this positive note, uh, Madam President, Cher Christine, thank you very much for a really interesting, wide-ranging discussion. Uh, we hope to welcome you next year in presence in Florence. Okay, and I Thanks promise my voice will be back by then. Thank you. Thank you.